And good morning to Asa. Thank good morning. You for good morning. Hello, everyone. Some time with us. Uh, good. You know, and Asa, we're going to just jump right in. I would say yes. a lot of people may know basic. And so I've got a lot of questions for you that people may be thinking about. The basic film work seems to be that Black Lives Matter, born after the shooting of Trayvon Martin, both as a social media and a protest movement, how much people know from there, it's not really clear, but I wanted, I wanted to start with what you took as the number one misconception you think people may have, and the number one thing you wish they knew. Well, first, thank you for having me, uh, and uh, thanks to the audience for coming. Black Lives Matter, I think the first false narrative is that we are some, uh, somehow some sort of a terrorist group, and, uh, and we're not. Yeah. Um, our actions at times in terms of protest can be militant, um, but we are clearly are not a uh, overthrow the government, making bombs somewhere, plotting to murder and kill police. We are not anti-police. Um, we are anti-police brutality. So those are the negative um, stereotypes and narratives that the conservative press uh, puts out there. And it makes it harder for us because we're trying to protect lives, we're trying to build coalitions, and when we have to fight against those, that type of negative uh, reporting from the media um, and the power of the conservative media, again, it makes it very difficult to build bridges. And so what do you think you wish, the number, well, I'll go to a different question. I went to the website and took a look at the various things the movement nationally says that it was working on, but it was hard for me to get a grasp on if I could think of three things, concrete things, that if we walked outside and they were changed, I would see them. If you to give examples of, it's this way now, concretely, I wish it were this way, what would you say? Well, first we want police officers to stop shooting and killing black people, black and brown people. And when they shoot and kill black and brown people, we need uh, for them to be uh, arrested, prosecuted, and go to jail. Um, now, I make no apologies um, regarding my criticism against law enforcement. Uh, it, it is a, a bully uh, game that targets black and brown people and poor people. We want justice. And we're just not saying it in the streets, no justice, no peace. We want justice, and I think we deserve justice. And so that's the main thing that um, we're, we're fighting for. We want transparency. We want accountability. Our lives matter. White lives have always that's, that's never been up to debate. Blue lives, you're not born with a blue uniform. You take your uniform off and be a productive citizen. You understand? Know we're asking police officers, not asking at this point, we're demanding that simply because you put that uniform on doesn't mean that you take your humanity off. What does that concretely mean? If I'm an officer and I go into a situation and I feel threatened, I think somebody's going to shoot at me or somebody's going to shoot at a citizen, or something's going on. Yes, there's situations where we can talk about is there a way to de-escalate or reevaluate. But there's some situations where probably their actions are appropriate and more aggressive with reaction. How is it that you want the system to change and how they evaluate that stream of events? Well, we're not if, if you're a police officer, obviously your your job is to uphold the law. And there are certain circumstances where that type of aggression is um, is justified. Um, but you should not get your brain shot out simply because of a tail light is on. Our black women should not be pulled over like Samuel Bland and wind up hung in jail. You know, these, this is the extreme which unfortunately have now become norm um, when law enforcement is dealing with black and brown people. I think what we're asking again for Black Lives Matter is demanding is that there is accountability when law enforcement kill black and brown people. And uh, there is no accountability at this point. You had Eric Gardner, uh, a young, uh, a gentleman father, murdered, you saw it, you saw the video, choked to death. And the only person that actually went to jail was the Hispanic young man who videotaped it. And that's backwards. And that doesn't make you angry. See, for me, I'm not going to be uh, apologetic about saying black lives matter. You understand? I want total liberation for black and brown people. I want poor people to be treated 
fair in this country. You understand? So there is no, um, for me, you know, to, to try to bring some sort of peace. Um, we, there is no peace when black and brown people are in broken pieces. We need to have the conversation where we can heal. But how do we start that healing process? We start by having um, accountability for law enforcement um, and protection. We need to know that as American citizens, we are protected under the laws that our white counterparts are protected. So I'm going to take that in two parts. In terms of the original interaction that's leading to these situations, what is it that you would want to see change? A difference in screening, a difference in protocol, a difference in who gets called to what calls. Police officers often say they get called to do it all from domestic violence, mental health, criminal. What would you want to see different? I want police officers to not look at black and brown people as demons <coughs> or something that is uh, out of the Friday the 13th type of uh, character. How do we get there? What is well, we get there, first of all, by not, we get there by screening a lot of individuals who um, decide that they want to be police officers. Um, there is a screening process. You know, there's a mental uh, health evaluation. You know, we need to train our um, police officers much better than what they are at this point. Every cop knows which, you know, officers are racist in their, in, you know, in their community. You know, this is something that they don't wake up one morning and say, oh, I didn't know you were racist, Bob. You, you know the, the characters there. You know, and so if we have some, all these good cops that they're talking about, then where are they when it comes to making sure that these bad police officers are held accountable when they brutalize black and brown people? You know, we can sit here and talk I mean, here you are, accomplished black woman. But if people don't know that you're Tamla from Channel 6, you know, you're right in the same boat with Sandra Bland and all the other black women who have been abused by law enforcement. You know, the point that we're making now is that we're tired of it. You know, black people are not going to beg anymore for justice. We want justice. We want liberation, you understand? We want to be able to be just like everyone else in this country. We want to be able to provide for our families. We want to be able to worship in our religious settings. We want to feel safe. And now it's gone with the threat of that safety because America has spoken and have elected a racist bigot. What do you say? So what do, you know, where do we go from this point? These are very scary and serious times. What do you say to people who say the police officers don't get help? that they, when they get to the scene, that they often encounter a hostile public or a public that won't help them, that won't snitch on what's going on in the situation, that, that there is a onus on the community as well to change this stuff. Well, first of all, if the police want uh, help in terms of snitching, they need to start snitching on their own, okay? And get rid of that, break down that blue wall of silence that they, that they constantly hide on. Also, if you want the help from black and brown people in these communities, stop occupying the community. Get out of your patrol car. Walk the beat. You know, find out who the leaders are in that neighborhood. Talk to the elders in that neighborhood. Talk to those young people. So when you ride up with your billy club and your gun drawn, you'll know exactly who are, who's in college and who's not. You don't interact. You know, you don't interact with law enforcement have traditionally um, frowned upon black and brown communities. And so, you know, if you want to start to bridge that gap, then you need to start offering an olive branch um, and communication and conversations with the individuals that you are sworn to protect and serve. The corollary to that question is, today we find out there have been 600 plus murders in Chicago, many of them black people, on black people as an issue here in Philadelphia. Do you think that, and I'm sure you get this question a lot, is there a role for Black Lives Matter when we do it to each other? Or is it only a external excuse me, conversation? No, the black lives, and that's a, again another false narrative. We have always generationally been in the neighborhoods to try to salvage the uh, violence in our neighborhoods. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I don't like to deal with, because those are two different conversations. We're talking about police violence. Um, Why are they two different Because police, because we have, again, we have always, always in our neighborhoods um, been that rock. There was always an elder there. There was always a big brother there. There was always an uncle there to come out. There was always an ex-gang member to come into the neighborhood to try to salvage uh, violence in our neighborhood. Uh, we don't want to be distracted. You know, we can walk into at the same time. We can talk and deal with violence in our community, but we can also deal and hold those accountable uh, in law enforcement who beat and brutalize us as well. You know, I don't want it to get muddy the waters. When we're talking about accountability and transparency, um, you know, I don't want to get into, well, well what about a black on black crime, you know? No, 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 no. We can talk about, if you want to discuss violence in the black community, then let's sit down and discuss black, um, violence in the black community. And then we can discuss violence in the white community. You know, anywhere there's a portion of people, um, majority of people in that neighborhood, you can go to Fishtown and find that same type of um, violence. You know, you can go to Northeast and find it. You can go to Chinatown and find a level of violence. So I don't want us to get distracted when we are demanding accountability for police officers who beat and kill black and brown people. You and I were talking backstage about difficult conversations, and I, I, I will come at the question this way, because I take your point about not wanting to get distracted. I think sometimes when I look at the issue, it's a tough conversation to have. You would like police officers to say, yes, there are people among us who shouldn't be there but we want you to hear our concerns. Mm -hmm. And I hear from them that they would want you to say yes for the of these issues in our community, that we have to have a hand in solving. But we want you to hear our concerns. But it often seems as though the two sides say, I don't want to get distracted, I want to talk about one thing. They say, we don't want to get distracted, we want to talk about one thing. And then nobody ends up talking. How do you break the difference? Well, we, the fact is, and I've spoken to many um, law enforcement officers here in Philadelphia. I've even worked with some in terms of um, at-risk youth and trying to get them connected to the community. What we need is um, to continue the conversation, but after the conversation is over, we need to have some sort of goals that we reached out of this conversation, or we're just talking. And time is wasted. We don't have time, you know, as a country now, we don't have time to have uh, idle chat. We need to sit down and have true dialogue, build coalitions. If we're going to try to heal law enforcement with black and brown community, then we need to have those difficult conversations and we have to be honest. And then we need to have some sort of strategy in place so both parties can agree and walk out um, of that meeting to implement those conversations. But when you don't have law, when you have law enforcement who refuses to turn or to stand and speak out against those officers who brutalize and abuse their power, then we're right back to the conversations again. I'm not going to sit and have a conversation with someone who doesn't want solutions out of that conversation. It's a waste of my time. I could have conversations in the street with uh, organizing young people, old people in my community, educating them um, what their rights are. You know, if law enforcement wants to come along, sincerely and deal with that, then that's wonderful. But we're not going to have a conversation to make everyone feel better, and no one wants to have some sort of solutions out of those conversations. Do protests work? Do you, see, do you see a difference because there's a protest where people say, you're yelling at me? Yeah. No, protests have always worked. You know, um, Martin Luther King received that same type of question. It works. We need to have, um, the people need to be united and rise up when injustice shows its ugly face. What do you think is different now because of the protest versus when this started? I think this was well, sadly nothing that was, um, we're still fighting the same thing, which is racism and white supremacy. Um, but I think the beauty about this movement is gone from a hashtag to a movement. And uh, young people are organizing. And the beauty about it is uh, we are including our elders now, those who marched with King, those who felt that they didn't have a voice in the room. You know, I've met with some extraordinary elders 
they've given me advice as a young person and, um, and the support and also that we are connecting yet again with our allies um, we're connecting with our Jewish brothers and sisters I just met with um, a group of our brothers and sisters uh, two weeks ago um, and built that coalition we're um, connecting with our LGBTQ community um, and I think now even more we need to build those coalitions. And I think with Black Lives Matter, we invite them to um, the building of coalitions. So for somebody sitting out there when you say be an ally, what does that mean in your day-to-day -day life? Well, an ally is that if you see something wrong, if you see something that's hateful or racist in your circles, you speak up. You know, you're having a conversation. You have friends who say some very mean things. You know, family members that say things that are, are, are very negative. And, um, that's your time to be an ally, to check that person, you know, and say, you know, if you continue on with this, educate them first, because it's coming, it definitely comes out of ignorance, but to educate them, and if they don't want to, uh, you know, they continue with that type of uh, thinking, and bigotry, then you can take the stand and disassociate yourself with that person. Black Lives Matter has always prided itself on being organic. What is in Philly may not be what's in Kansas City, may not be was an open similar, but each place gets to do their own thing. In the wake of this election, do you think that model still works, or do you think there's more of a need for a across the board from Boston to San Diego response, or it stays the way it is? Well, I think we have sent out a 10-point plan um, from the national uh, chapter of Black Lives Matter, so we are all on the same page. Uh, this is not a fringe movement where someone is saying one thing, we are sticking and someone else is saying something else. We are sticking with the principles that have been laid out for us as activists and organizers. Do you think they're there for people who may not have gone to the site and not know what you mean to say that? Well, I would suggest everyone to go to www.blacklivesmatter.org and you can read exactly um, the 10 point plan. You can also send an email to get a response back um, to your questions. Also, we need to volunteer. You know, we have made it extremely um, easy now where um, any questions concerning Black Lives Matter, any um, false narratives that you may think about Black Lives Matter, you can read it right there from our own words. You know, and I encourage people to do that. You know, I really encourage at this point in one of the reasons why I even accepted this invitation, and I'm very humble for the invitation, is that as the head of Black Lives Matter here in Philadelphia, I want to build bridges. You understand? My goal is to build bridges with our allies uh, because I truly believe that the power is always with the people. And um, when you have individuals who, in high places, who uh, benefit, like this government benefits from keeping us divided. I'm going to ask you a Donald Trump question in a minute. We <laughs> talked a little bit about the protests, and I think people just hear that with your police. And I want to go back to my question of two other things. If you want people to think of two other concrete things that you'd like to see different in Philadelphia, what would you tell them? We must continue to. This country is right. will not uh, stand here in Philadelphia. So I think we really mean Philly is a different breed. Yeah. You know, we don't tolerate a bunch of people. Everybody voted for Trump is a racist big period, and a homophobe, and clearly have issues with women. The man told you. I, I, I'm anti-Semitic. The man told you. But does that scare you? That the idea it's, that it's but the house was clearly burning, and uh, so he opened the Pandora's box and made it. Um, Proud made it easy to be a bigot. These films have always offered. So where are we in four years the next time the election comes around?
I don't I don't know where this is going. I didn't see um, Trump. Uh, you know, and so I think we can build from a grassroots level that type of foundation where we can stand up against bigots and his supporters and say, you know, you won the election, but we're going to kick your ass each and every time in the street. And they heard some chants about something violent towards police. Is that um, I organize nationally. You know, I can't stop. To us in our movement, if we say our lives matter, but let's advocate to kill you. Understand? So what we're trying to do again is to show focus and shine a spotlight that our lives. Are true. Violent confrontation for any. Um, uh, pro for law enforcement to come up with something a little more creative. And let's not be surprised. I'm looking for more time. Saw what happened with Freddie Gray. They did. Is that just the way it goes, or how does that then change that even if you do get a day in court, chances are the odds are not likely? Well, that's why we need to continue to organize and to continue to protest, and sometimes we're going to be extremely um, serious. When you say no justice, no peace, you know, that's exactly what we mean. You can't have peace if there is no justice. You want justice, you have to. No peace, you know, no peace in terms of anything. I see us having a voting block. We're still going to, I see us still in the streets, but I think um, I see all of us to get into the door. Now that we're at the table, we don't have anything to say. We can't do that. We have to work. And the allies of people in other groups too.